So, let me just go to the website. So the conference takes place the 4th and the 5th. Uh, registration is still open. We have about 100 people registered, which is awesome. Uh, just to give you a little background, we have typically met as a smaller group uh, over the years, over the last uh, five years since I've been at the CPD uh, in the fall. And we've had sort of more virtual events and other times of the year. So this year, um, I wanted to do something a little different and in consultation with the advisory board for the faculty development community of practice we decided to have a, a full out conference with a call for proposals and sessions and so we have about 40 sessions it will take place over two days. Um, uh, Provost Larson will be there to uh, welcome everybody. Is he here? Did he take off already? Uh, and then uh, on Thursday the 4th, uh, on the 5th we have, uh, and then we'll have keynote sessions that day uh, on the 5th, we have a keynote speaker, uh, Brett Enan, from uh, LaGuardia Community College. Uh, and he'll be speaking um, on, let's see, I'll get the title, is on the agenda. So you can see all the sessions, all the awesome sessions. Uh, and you can check out the sessions before you register if you're, you know, you want to decide whether or not you want to register. Uh, and so Brett's keynote will be on learning, teaching, and deep learning, faculty development, and the future of higher education. So um, that's about my time probably, uh, but like I said, sign up there. If you have any questions, let me know. April 4th, 5th, New Faults, be there or, you know.
right, so this is twofold. I'll pull this up. Uh, Maureen is actually going to be recording me today. I'm going to be sharing what I'm talking about today with my effective speaking class so that they can see a little bit of what people do in the professional world. So if you want to show the audience, you can do that too, because they think that nine students is a lot to have to speak in front of. <laughs> so I want to share with you today um, a little bit about the Online Learning Consortium's Leadership and Online Learning Mastery Series that I'm in. And Doodle, the directors of Online Learning Group, has graciously paid for a good chunk of this to go through. So I will be sharing some information back with the Doodle group, and I'm happy to do webinars if anybody else has any interest or just to chat about it. But the structure of it is that there are three workshop sessions. There's two kind of two-week periods where we work and reflect and really are kind of coming up with a plan. And then there's one wrap-up and closing. So we'll be done in mid-April. And what we'll have at the end of that is a future plan for online learning. And what it has us do is really look at why distance education and distance learning is important, and not just at the state level or the United States level, but we're actually looking at a national level. And it's really awesome because I'm talking with people from Ireland and from the European Union, and we're really getting some um, insight there to how other people are doing online learning. Then we're also looking at different organiz in dis different institutional models. So is it decentralized, is it centralized? What is the leadership structure look like in online learning? So we're, we're kind of looking at all those different things and thinking what will work at our institutions and what, what may not work. We're also looking at policy. So our institutional policies, any systems that we're part of, any governmental organizations or any kind of worldwide global things that we're looking at. Um, if we want international students, then we might have to look at the GDPR or RP, yes. <laughs> um, and then we also have some funding models. So we're looking at financing the initiatives that we want to do and the economics behind how you actually create a sustainable program. So we're, we're really doing a lot of really cool thinking and good work. And I hope to, I really look forward to sharing that back with Doodle. Thank you. I don't have any slides or anything. So uh, for those of you who have um, known me for as long as I've been here, back in 2008, Dutchess Community College put an online course policy in place for um, kind of restricting what students can take our online courses. Um, at the time, it was the students needed a 2.5 GPA, and full-time students needed to have taken 12 credits of um, college work. As of uh, winter session this year, we no longer have that policy in place. So those of you who have been following our uh, experiment, our 10-year experiment, the experiment is now over. So um, what we did, we actually, um, this was a faculty-driven um, idea. And this came from, um, the initial idea came from our business department. And um, the faculty were the ones who thought about uh, replacing it with a mandatory orientation. Um, and three of our faculty members, all three of whom are online teaching ambassadors as well, and one of whom is, who is here to accept her award, um, they were the ones who wrote the, or, the mandatory orientation. Um, I did the technical stuff to make sure everyone got enrolled in it and um, reminding them to take it, all that kind of stuff. Um, the only numbers that we have so far are our winter session numbers, which we're not really using those to compare because we get a different type of student in the winter session. Um, but winter session 2018, um, we had 272 students at uh, census, and um, we had about a 92% um, persistence rate towards the end of the semester, and that was 17 sections. And this winter session, um, we had 20 sections, and we had about an 89%. So we did have a little bit of a change there. We are looking closely at our spring semester, which is going right now, but we have seen a big change in enrollment for our spring semester after we uh, took away that um, blocking thing. And I know a lot of you have talked to me about this for years, so you guys win. <laughs> so for um, last spring, spring 2018, we had um, 887 students at the beginning of the semester, and we gave 63 sections. 
And spring 2019, we had 1,201 at the beginning of the semester with also 63 sections. So they're filling more, we're getting more students. The um, important numbers aren't coming until May, um, and we're hoping those important numbers will not be a huge drop. Um, since we are opening up the pool, um, we're expecting it to drop a little bit at least. Um, but we're hoping it's not going to be a huge one because we have our mandatory orientation in place. And then we'll use that data to update the orientation. So those of you who have been following our experiment at Duchess for now it's been 10 years, now you know the end of it and we are moving on to a new experiment. <laughs> Thank you very much. Many of you already know about the dashboards. I mentioned them yesterday, but I just wanted to make sure the link was in this document for those of you who don't know the link or are new to this community. Um, I'm not gonna click on it. If you click on the link, it's basically a list of a variety of different data visualizations. Um, there's also a link to a dashboard guide, which explains to you a little bit more about the data that's available on each visualization. Um, I'm hoping as we continue to redesign the website that I can provide this in a more uh, aesthetically appealing format where there are maybe like thumbnails of each data visualization and a little more like tags, things like that, so you can more easily find the information you're looking for, but we're not quite there yet, but we do have the dashboard guide, so that's there for you as well. And then the second thing I just wanted to mention, and again, I sort of alluded to this yesterday, that Kim and I are involved in a working group um, with OLC, WCET, and UPSEA regarding national online learning definitions. Um, something they might be putting together is a survey to understand nationally how people are defining online courses, students, and programs. Uh, but something we may do before that even launches is a survey to you all to understand how you're, and we've done a little bit of this before about definitions, but trying to really more understand about the coding that you have in your SISs um, for online courses. And we know that you map that to the definitions that we have, and we've worked through a lot of that, but now we're sort of trying to get at more of the details of what exactly you're, how exactly you're coding things. Um, for programs, do you have separate program codes for your students? Where's the information about um, if a student says they want to, if they're applying for an online program, where does that information get stored? So some of that more technical stuff, which we're gonna send that out to you, but you will probably have to connect with your institutional research folks and your registrars on your campuses to answer that. But it'll be really informative for us, especially as we move forward with SUNY Online and if there's any data infrastructure that's gonna be developed for that, um, your input could be useful in that way. So that's all I got. Hi everybody, I'm Robin Sullivan and I was um, able to talk to most of you yesterday and I just wanted to take another minute, I will make it quick, about the EM Tech MOOC that is available. Um, the link that's in the document will take you to a page that shows the impact that the project has had over the um, year that it has launched and shows all of the different um, badges that we have awarded and the statistics of who has been involved, but also that list contains um, links to some of the e-portfolios that have been developed through the program. I just want to mention that we have a call for mentors. We really need your help. We would like to make this um, an example of a Coursera-based MOOC that really pushes community within a MOOC. Um, that's not something that you see regularly. It's often very passive learning. Um, this is open to all SUNY faculty, staff, and students. And we may have shot ourselves in the foot by whitelisting every single SUNY campus so everybody can get into that MOOC and earn a verified Coursera certificate for free if you're with SUNY. Um, that goes against our ability to sustain ourselves to keep it going. It's run continuously for the past year, and we need people like you. We have a lot of graduate students that are in the MOOC that are serving as mentors and um, it's you know just a very informal commitment. If you do provide mentoring in each of the modules, we will be able to provide a digital badge for that effect. So just a call, um, please um, step forward and help us mentor in the MOOC and I'd appreciate anybody's help 
either yourself or anybody at your campus. I have some cards. If anybody is unfamiliar about it, please make sure to come talk to me and I'll tell you more. Thanks. Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Courier um, from SUNY Canton. I am a criminal just justice faculty member um, there as well as the chair of our online learning advisory committee, which is a committee composed primarily of teaching faculty, two representatives from each of our schools as well as an instructional designer. Um, and that committee also has a subcommittee um, called the Student Online Learning Advisory Committee and I thought given the really positive reaction to the student panel yesterday that this would be a, a pretty timely topic to present to you today. Um, so really what I wanted to talk about was kind of the the low commitment but high reward um, model that this is and sort of how we communicate our results um, and the importance of that. So. <clears throat> I'm the chair of OLAC, and SOLAC reports to OLAC. Um, yes. So I report to myself, and then I also report to Dr. Mott, who's the associate provost. And because online learning advisory committee is composed of six teaching faculty and an instructional designer, any of the information that is reported from me to me um, to this group is also then communicated to the teaching faculty in those various schools. So there's communication stream to the faculty, which is very important, but then also our group as an advisory committee is charged with making recommendations um, and providing communication directly to Dr. Mott, who also funnels that communication to senior leadership on campus. So the Student Online Learning Advisory Committee has really a direct line of communication to campus leadership on issues much like those that you heard yesterday from um, most recently it was the student perspective that was really important in terms of how we decided what lecture capture, capture solution we were going to go with or which um, proctoring solution that we were most interested in and those student um, comments were really um, critical in understanding their experience and how certain technologies would work in that environment or what was the, really the most important thing. Um, so I have linked on the Google Doc our charge, which I'm not going to open for you. You're free to do that. Um, but I would be happy to answer any questions about recruiting students if you're interested in that to serve on the committee or any of the other really interesting and important things that we've learned from our student online learning advisory committee. Thank you. But it's okay. Good. Good afternoon, everyone. Sherry Chibangu, Monroe Community College. Uh, I'm faculty there. I teach a number of courses, one being an introductory uh, business course. And so um, very often those are my younger, uh, younger students. And um, as hard as I try to uh, outline instructions, for example, instructions on how to register for the publisher's website, instructions on how to submit an assignment, uh, they still struggle. Uh, and so um, I have the uh, great benefit of working with the uh, virtual campus dream team at MCC. And so they've actually uh, helped me to use uh, Screencastify. How many of you use Screencastify? Oh, let me tell you. You need to check it out. Um, it, it gives you, one, the ability to um, capture the screen, and again, I, I won't lead you to that. So I've literally created a video walking them through exactly where to go to register.
for McGraw-Hill Connect or how to submit an assignment. So for those who read the instructions and they get it, great, but I have really cut down on the number of calls that I, um, uh, that I get asking me about how to submit an assignment, how to register. Um, and in the past, I've also used it uh, uh, to capture uh, concepts. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful uh, to the virtual campus team at MCC because when I forget how to use it, I've been able to go uh, there and, um, and get support. So I just encourage you to, to check it out and thank you for listening. Good afternoon. Let's see if I can scroll this down a little bit. There we go. So, when people find out I'm from Plattsburgh, the first thing they do is ask me, how can I adjust my career path so that I too can settle in one of the northernmost uh, communities in the United States, <laughs> in the contiguous United States? Well, here's your chance because we have a job opening for a concierge. And if you're not looking for it, we're, I hope that you know somebody who is. Uh, it's, it's a great place to work. Um, you know, our beaches are beautiful. The tropical breezes are great for about a week during the summer. And uh, if you look in the photograph there, you can see in the distance the Adirondacks. And occasionally it snows there, and I hear the skiing is great. So uh, if you know anybody who's interested, uh, we call this position the uh, Online Learning Support Specialist. Basically, it's a concierge, and if you go to this document, you'll see the link to the uh, Human Resources page where you can read the description and apply. Thank you. That's all I have. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Brian O'Keefe from Farmingdale State College. Um, I'm happy to say I'm the, one of the only, I think, Long Islanders that made it up here. My other colleagues. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's. Yeah, it, it was quite entertaining. I, I uh, was in Rochester for eight years, so it was, for me it was like whatever, but uh, glad I could make it. Uh, so uh, this, my name is Brian O'Keefe. I'm a uh, assistant professor. This is a research project funded by New York State and a research collaboration between Edinburgh and Napier University in Scotland. Uh, right off the bat, this project is a bit mental. Um, it's mental because we're designing um, in virtual reality. So we're collaborating with our colleagues in the UK in VR. And uh, what, what's happened is, um, any, any uh, Downton Abbey uh, enthusiasts out there? Uh, so this is the real life Downton Abbey, a, an estate in uh, just south of the Highlands donated their property to this massive uh, uh, sculpture park. And as you can see in that little photograph, that's someone's driveway. That's how, that's how crazy uh, this estate is. And we have um, 360 VR of all these different locations at this estate in Scotland. Our students in New York are designing uh, a virtual, uh, they're, 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 they're designing real life tours for physical real people in the context of VR. So they can only experience Jupiter Artland in VR, but they're designing for people in the physical real world. So it's, again, it's a bit mental. Now when they collaborate, they don't do any kind of video Skyping, they collaborate in uh, Minecraft. So when they want to explore and discuss and oh, have open discussions, they're in Minecraft. Thankfully, the, the Brits gave us a, a, a Minecraft version of Jupiter Artland. So you can kind of see here in this photo above, here's our students, our physical students, and this is their same students in Minecraft. So they can collaborate, they can talk to each other, they can have those open discussions. And then, of course, this is because in Minecraft you can fly, so they can easily fly around the park, of course, and meander about. Uh, right off the bat, we have no idea what we're doing. It's great fun because we're learning as we go, we're developing this project as we go along, and we're getting all kinds of challenges along the way, and uh, we're having a great time. Thank you.
Testing. There we go. That mic, I think, is dead. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was a, a quick plug for the enrollment planning roundtable process. So this is the open SUNY process, and this was instrumental in helping us decide uh, what, where our efforts into online were going to be focused in terms of new programs. So uh, I encourage all of you to, to talk to the open SUNY staff about that, but I'm also happy to share with anybody who's interested in, in, in the plan that came out of ours. We found it uh, to be an incredibly helpful process for identifying what we we're launching uh, this fall, our first online bachelor's completion program. So it's an AS to BS in sustainability management that was identified through the enrollment planning roundtable process. Um, and I'm just gonna do a quick plug. So uh, Ashley Gujar, our other instructional designer, and I will be presenting at CIT on the faculty development process. So we have 14 faculty who have almost exclusively never taught online um, and so we've been we've taken a cohort approach here um, and so after giving them sort of a brief overview of online one of the things that I think the process we found helpful is that blackboard was both a fear and a work obstacle for faculty so in our faculty development we really focused on developing the course outside of blackboard and relying on us as the instructional designers to then figure out how to get the authentic assessments, uh, how do these things work into the real world, and how to, how to sort of either bootstrap or make them fit into the tools within Blackboard so that the, the outcomes that the faculty are looking for are being achieved, um, and, and also meeting our accessibility requirements by also keeping them off of the Blackboard system because it's easier for us to train a work study to, to put what they want into Blackboard while making sure we're checking all of our boxes in terms of accessibility. So come see us at CIT. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Janice Jones. I'm on the nursing faculty at the University of Buffalo and I teach a graduate course in organizations and quality and safety. And it's not the most exciting course for our graduate students. Um, plus our students also uh, not only have a heavy course load, but they also have their clinical practicums as well. So in order to keep our students on track, I developed a weekly checklist. Well, I'll have watch this video or do this or do that. Uh, and I find my students really just get overwhelmed. So uh, thanks to my uh, wonderful husband who is here today, who also makes my accommodations and handles my luggage when I go to conferences, uh, what I decided to do is insert a stress reliever uh, into every class. So on the checklist, I have highly recommended that they see a video regarding one of the Subaru Barkley dogs. So if you're not familiar with it, I will show this to you. And I met some of my students face to face and they're like, oh, Dr. Jones, we just loved your videos about the dogs. They could care less about anything else they may have learned, but they love these videos. So um, I will show you one and hopefully it will um, put a smile on on your face as well. Thank you. Oh, here? What am I here? Oh. Um, so they 
view one of these every week. I put the link in and I put the one that I want them to watch. And I could not believe the response that I got from them. So um, I hope it's a low stress reliever for you at well. It certainly brings a smile to your face, especially for you dog lovers. Thank you. Testing one, two. Great, I get to follow dogs. <laughs> Hi, I'm Chuck Deshays. I'm uh, from SUNY Plattsburgh. I um, work in their Canadian Studies Department. Um, I came down with John Locke. <laughs> Damn near killed him on the way down. I didn't know that streets only go some, sometimes the different direction than, than what I'm driving. So sorry about that, John. But he's still here. We're still here. Good, we're good, good. Anyways, and my tan has clearly worn off. Okay. So from that sunny Plattsburgh weather that we get. Um, uh, what I do is I, John, I met John through a Moodle training. I was going through Moodle training, teaching online for the first time. And he mentioned something about a non, well, what we call a one button studio. So I go and I shoot videos uh, for my class. Um, and I guess I'm very, very rare on the Plattsburgh campus. Very few uh, faculty take advantage of this. And I think it really helps, it personalizes the course for my students. And they see me, you know, through the halls or in a cafeteria. It's like, you're my professor. I know you. I have a question for you. <laughs> and so it's good for that. And also, at, at SUNY Plattsburgh, we have course opinion surveys at the end of every semester, as does as, as every university. And at our university, I find the course opinion surveys to not be entirely helpful all the time. So what I've done is, for my online class, is I've devised a, a practice at the end of every semester for the final week's uh, assignment, where they go ahead and I tell them, you're now the instructor. Something has happened. We have, a new, we have a new section of Introduction to Canada. And since you've now been you know, educated to, in all the material that I've given you, you get to run the class. And you tell me how you want this class to be operated. You're the teacher now. You get to decide what is discussed, what topics are discussed, what additional topics do you want to bring in. Which topics did you find not very useful? And I get a lot of really great feedback from this. You know, how are you going to evaluate people? How are you going to do that? You know, that's that's really important thing. Did you think there was they'll then they'll let let you know there was too much discussion forum? I didn't get a lot out of the discussion forum or whatever it was. And also, to that end, it's also helped me to strengthen my course. Uh, they've asked you know over uh, I've heard from students we read. Where are the women in this course? I didn't have enough women in my course. So I changed that. I put a new segment in there. Also, you mentioned slightly, you mentioned a little bit about indigenous people, but we didn't see a whole lot. That is now. I changed my course to reflect that, too. So I take these course opinions, these course opinion surveys, much more serious, and it's a very useful tool. Um, I just recommend anyone who has uh, is looking to get some real feedback. I mean, the students up here yesterday, they were fantastic. They were absolutely fantastic. And we could have had him here all week. And we still would have you know, been clamoring for more. And we're looking for, always looking for ways to get student impact or student feedback. And that might be one option for you. Thanks. Thanks, Charles. Jackie? Jackie? Oh, here she comes. So my name is Jackie Dipsinski. I'm from SUNY Brockport. I teach a fully 100% uh, course, graduate courses online. Uh, one of the things last semester, and I thought it was funny he was talking about surveys because I surveyed my students, and one of the things I found out in that survey was that my students were coming from a more traditional classroom in their undergraduate. They're working full time, and they really didn't have a lot of time to figure out technology issues. So one of the things I developed this past, uh, in between the break, was uh, troubleshooting for Blackboard issues with all the main content areas that I use in my courses. Uh, I have gotten a lot less, matter of fact, I think I've only gotten one up to this point question from a student about technology issues and what they needed to do, which is awesome. 
And then the other part of this is that um, it's helping them to be more self-directed because when they go into those links, it's going to give them the exact description of what they need to do step by step. And there's a video in there as well that um, students have access to all of this information, but sometimes I feel like they don't know how to navigate that, especially if they're not coming from the traditional classroom. So that's it in a quick nutshell, and <laughs> we'll move on. Thank you. Tony. Tony, I think you're up. Oh, okay, great, Mike. Hey, Mike. Hi, everyone. Mike Daly from SUNY OER Services, uh, OER Campus Strategist. Just want to let you know of some of the updates over the last two years of open educational resource use in SUNY. As I'm sure some of you know, we've received um, a total of $8 million from the New York State budget over the last two years. Um, we're confident that we're going to see that money again coming in the next year and slightly more confident than we'll see it in a couple years after that. Um, we can proudly say that we know um, at least 155,000 SUNY students are taking an OER course this year. Um, those courses are involving 4,600 different sections across SUNY. Um, 59 campuses are actively participating in the open educational resource effort. Um, and we are pretty confident in saying that students have avoided through this effort spending $16 million on textbooks. Um, I think this conversation is especially applicable to this group um, because what we've learned in the very, very initial studies that we've done of the students in these group in these classes um, is that swapping a traditional textbook for an open textbook isn't enough. It doesn't really push um, the lever on student success in whatever measure. Um, and so really thinking about uh, the design that goes into using open educational resources, um, the absolutely essential role that instructional designers play in working with faculty um, to really leverage the power of the open educational resources is what we're after. We have a curated catalog that makes it easy for faculty um, to, re to preview and adopt and seamlessly integrate uh, their courses into the LMS. That's at oer.suny.edu. That's our ready to adopt catalog. We call it our ready to adopt catalog because all those courses have been, um, through our partnership with Lumen Learning, ADA certified. Um, if they involve courseware, that courseware meets FERPA standards. And all those courses also um, provide faculty with some ancillary resources that they might be used to, PowerPoints, test banks, uh, that sort of thing. That's not the only place faculty can obviously go to find open education resources, but we find it to be a useful starting place for a lot of our faculty. Any other questions? Tony DeFranco will take them all. He's in the back. Um, all right. But I put some links on, on the Google Docs, and thanks for the time, Alice. Okay, thank you very much to all our unconference speakers. I so appreciate your willingness to share and um, was particularly interested to see many of our online ambassadors sharing um, their enthusiasm and what they're um, uh, doing in their own instruction. If anyone else has any additional things they want to share, please add them to that Google Doc. We keep that as a running uh, document, a useful running document that we can refer back to. Um, and if you have any additional links and uh, supportive, interesting little graphics that you'd like to add to that, I would. Uh, um, uh, I think that would be fun too. Um, we're going to have lunch now, and um, lunch is in the room right next to us. Um, and uh, we're running a tiny little bit behind schedule, so uh, we're going to do lunch. Um, and we're having some some challenges with the setup, so we're going to have lunch for about an hour next door, and then we're coming back here to this room for the ambassador recognition, so that we can record and broadcast it. Um, I will. We will all let you know what time it is, and make sure that you can uh, come back for the uh, for the recognitions. Um, so please, let's go enjoy lunch, and I'll, we'll see you back here in an hour. <laughs>